because if we can be a pluralist democracy, then other Muslim countries that are more homo homogenous in their population in terms of language, in terms of ethnicity, it will be easier for them to become democracies. Remember, one of the great, great conundrums of the second half of the 20th century was that most parts of the world embraced democracy, mm. but fewer and fewer Muslim countries were democracies at the end of the 20th century. Why is that so? Well, some people would argue that it has to do with circumstances. Uh, most Muslim majority countries had the colonial experience. But when you look at uh, what's happened uh, in Iran with this election, regardless of how it ends up playing out, and you also uh, read an article that I picked up in, in a recent New York Times where it said uh, the villagers, talking about Pakistan, were rising up against the Taliban in a remote corner of northern Pakistan, and the area is D-I-R, Dera, is it pronounced Dera? Yes, Dera. Uh, Dera. Uh, more than a thousand villagers from the district uh, of Dera uh, rose up against the insurgents, and it was a bombing that they just said, enough is enough is enough. Absolutely. Do you see a parallel between what's happening in Pakistan with these villagers and what is happening with the young people in Iran of the train is moving out of the station and something is happening huge in that part of the world. Look, I would not like to comment on the developments in Iran because as an ambassador, it is inappropriate for me to, develop, uh, to uh, comment on developments in a, uh, in a neighborly country. But what I can say is... And that is a country that borders... It borders Pakistan, Pakistan. and with whom we have had historic relations and friendly relations. Uh, what is important to understand is that throughout the Muslim world, there is a great yearning for democracy. There is a great yearning for modernity. People want to retain their traditions. Mm. They want to retain their religion. Mm. They want to retain their historic roots. But at the same time, they want to be part of the modern world. Now, the Taliban represent a very cruel perspective. They want little girls not to go to school. They want women to be locked up in their homes and wear burqas instead of uh, being able to be part of the workforce or the education uh, or, or the population that receives education. They want men to live a certain way. They do not want men to have the choice between shaving their beards or not shaving their beards. Uh, and so they have such a narrow prism through which they view life that people cannot accept it. In the beginning, in many villages, the Taliban used to go, especially in the northwest of Pakistan, and said, we are only religious people who have come here to bring piety. And people would be a little more tolerant in the beginning. Then came the stage where people were scared of them because they had arms. And they were armed and they were very brutal. They would behead their opponents. Uh, they would kill anybody that they did not agree with or that did not agree with them. Now is the third stage where people say, enough is enough. We will mobilize. And the government of Pakistan, must be given credit for helping these people, our military, our, uh, our civilian authorities, are helping the people organize what are known as lashkars or populist armies to rise up against the Taliban militia. Mr. Ambassador, let me ask you this question. Uh, was it when the uh, Taliban came into the Swat Valley, which is only 60 miles away from the capital city, Islamabad, uh, was it too close for comfort and that caused the military as well as the government to take notice and to say, yes, we better act here. Uh, actually, the government and the military were constantly prepared and knew what to do about the Taliban. Pakistani public opinion was not. For various reasons, Pakistani public opinion had been confused. There were ah. people who said, people who said, why don't we negotiate? But with the, these in the guys? past, didn't they kind of? Let me just. They came yeah, yeah. and they said, let they'll go yeah. away. There were people who felt that way. Our media, for example, many people in our media used to say, let's negotiate with these guys. Okay, mm -hmm. so they want a sort of slightly conservative lifestyle. Let them have a little enclave where they can have that. Yes. Only when they came that close, and. Also, by the way, they were not close in the sense that they could march on the capital because the capital and the Swat Valley, the Swat Valley, of course, is encircled by mountains, so the mm -hmm. capital is protected by mountains. But what it helped do was it brought news of what is happening in Taliban-controlled territory to mainstream Pakistan. And when Pakistanis found out that the Taliban lash women, give them whip, you yes, know, whip them, beat them up, pictures of that started coming out that they actually beat up men for not growing a beard, 
that they break television and radios because they don't want people to be connected to the modern and world. And then the suicide bombings. And then suicide bombings. People said, gosh, this is not what we want. And now there is a, you know, Pakistan's parliament finally passed a resolution saying, we need to go and fight these guys. And so, in some ways, our president, by the way, President Zardari, mm -hmm. told American officials, and he said this to President Obama too, he said, look, I was never in favor of negotiating with these guys because I knew you can't negotiate with them. They killed my wife. I know what kind of people they are. However, most of my people wanted to negotiate. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like you've had in America certain leaders who wanted to talk to Cuba, but they couldn't because the general opinion was against negotiating with Castro. Do you think Similar situation in reverse in Pakistan. So the well. people are on board now. Now the people are on board. If you watch Pakistani television now, you will find a lot more people saying, hey, we have to beat these guys, we have to fight this war, and we have to win it. And so there is greater uh, support for the government and the military in waging this war. Are there still people in the military and in the intelligence service who are sympathetic to the Taliban? Look, when you have a major operation like we did from 1979 onward for two, almost three decades, in which there are individuals from the military uh, and our intelligence services who are acting on a day-to-day -day basis with the various jihadi groups, mm -hmm. there will always be some individuals who start developing a kind of a rapport with these guys and start saying maybe these guys have a worldview that is not that wrong, a kind of ideological sympathy. Um, uh, to cite an American example, people from the old CIA of the 1960s and 70s who still don't see what was wrong with sending uh, exploding uh, cigars to Fidel Castro as a means of securing America, but those people are no longer in charge. The Pakistani military, the Pakistani intelligence service, and the Pakistani government are all on board in understanding the Taliban as an existential threat to Pakistan, extremism as an existential threat to Pakistan, and people who want Pakistan to now move into the next stage where we can get rid of this menace and move towards modernity, better relations with Afghanistan, a democratic Afghanistan, better relations with India, a democratic India, and of course, a strategic partnership with the United States. President Obama comes along, and uh, in a word, how was his speech uh, in uh, Cairo uh, uh, received in Pakistan? There has been this feeling that the United States doesn't like the Muslim world and vice versa. So the fact that President Obama said, we have no quarrel with the Muslims for being Muslims. Mm -hmm. We have no quarrel with the world of Islam. We would like to work together. And we really do not believe that a clash of civilizations is inevitable. That was a message that was received positively. Shh. Now, are there cynics and skeptics? who say, no, 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 this is all part of some grand conspiracy on the part of the Americans to try and uh, unleash imperialist designs on our part of the world. Hey, those kinds of crazies exist here too. I go, was, to, the, that's what I I mean, I, I go to the internet, I go to the internet and I find people who are still debating whether 9-11 even happened, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and whether it was an inside job. Is so there those a calm, kind of people are there calm voice from the president versus the violence of the jihadists? Do you see that? playing out I right think, now? I think, I think a calm voice from the United States. Look, the United States is the world's most powerful country in economic terms, in military terms, in political terms. So when you have that kind of power, it is important to speak softly and to make others feel that you are listening to them. Mm -hmm. And I think President Obama is doing just that. And I think that will have a positive effect. Um, the relationship between uh, Pakistan and the uh, United States right now. In the past, and you referenced this, uh, money was given and a lot of that money was uh, used by the military. And now it's a different uh, uh, game as far as the President, the Secretary of State, Clinton, even the Congress of the United States. They want a commitment from Pakistan to fight the Taliban, to have a democracy, to be transparent with this money. And there's a lot of money on the table, not only the emergency money now, but the 1.5 billion per year for the next five years. Uh, Pakistan really has to step up to the plate, doesn't it? But Pakistan feels that we have a leadership right now mm -hmm. that is committed to democracy. I mean, everybody in Pakistan's government right now uh, has either been